that constant battle of trying to do right and wrong and worrying about that on the inside of who you are, Christ ends that. Today is the day, Good Friday, when we celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And I wanna share a devotional with you. I wanna read some scriptures with you. And I really want to help unpack for you what this means. Today is my favorite day of the year. And that might sound a little bit strange to some of you, but growing up, we would talk about the sacrifice of Jesus. We'd read the story in the gospel of what Jesus did today but I never understood what it meant. I thought that the cross was the declaration of my guilt. Every time I saw a crucifix, I saw Jesus hanging on the cross, I thought to myself, I am so evil that God, when he got close to me, that's what I did to him. And I would feel this tremendous shame and guilt But that's not what the cross declares. And I want to unpack for you why. The cross is the single greatest act of love and the most unjust thing that ever happened in human history. If anybody has ever wronged you, if they've ever done something they shouldn't have, if you've been a victim of a horrible crime, it could even be attempted murder, rape, whatever, it pales in comparison to the evil and the pain and the suffering that Jesus endured on the cross. And here's why. Jesus suffered greater than any other human being has ever or will ever suffer because he wanted you to know that he knows what it feels like. Jesus knows what it feels like to be sick He knows what it feels like to be poor. He knows what it feels like to be hated. He knows what it feels like to be betrayed by everyone. He knows what it feels like to be stripped naked and literally have nails driven through his hands, hung up. Now we we glorify a cross. We, We make a religious symbol out of a cross. But what the cross was, was the single most gruesome method of execution ever invented in human history. Because see, here's what would happen. Nails would be driven through really the wrists of the victim, because if they were driven through the hands, they would rip out. But they would be driven through the wrists of the victim and through the feet. And the victim was hung up, high up so that they could be insulted, so that they could be derided by anybody who walked by. They would see, this is somebody who is guilty. This is evil. This is what we do to evil people. So humiliated, shamed, in great pain. And here's the worst part. It wasn't lethal the way that they drove the nails through the wrists or through the feet. What was lethal was the fact that the person would, would of exhaustion because they would have to lift themselves up on their wrists and on their feet, which would be excruciating pain because they have to lift themselves up on literally on nails that are going through their body just to get a breath of air. And so people would die because they would drown in fluid in their own lungs from exhaustion. Now, why do I share that with you? What I want you to know is how much you matter to Jesus and what the sacrifice of the cross really means. Because I didn't, I didn't know what it meant and I wish somebody had told me. But I'm gonna share a bunch of verses with you And I want you to hear, I I pray, I'm going to pray for you. I pray that the Holy Spirit will make these verses come alive in your heart, that you can know that to the King of the Kings, to the Lord of the universe, you were worth every drop of blood and every second of agony. You were worth it because he loves you so much. The very first verse we're going to start out with 
And here's what I've titled this message. It's from Jesus's perspective, what I was thinking about when I went to the cross. And that might be a radical statement, but the reason I can say that is it's what he says in the scripture. He tells us what he was thinking about. So listen to this first verse. It's from Matthew 13. It's verses 45 and 46. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, he went and he sold all that he had and he bought that pearl. Now, before you interpret that verse the way that many of us have been taught it for years, Listen, most of us have been taught that verse means we're the merchant and we have to give up everything we have to get the kingdom of heaven, which is that pearl of great price. But that's not what the verse says at all. The verse says the kingdom of heaven is the merchant and he is seeking beautiful pearls. And when he had found one, he sold all that he had. Okay, look, you got to hear this. If the kingdom of heaven is the merchant, that makes you the pearl of great price. And when it says he sold all that he had, it means what is the most valuable thing in the kingdom of heaven? The son of God. Heaven was bankrupt to purchase you. The kingdom of heaven, God the Father is the merchant. And it says when he had found one pearl of great price, he bankrupted heaven. He paid the full price of the blood of his son who actually died, was separated from him so that he could have relationship with you. What that means is if you were the only person who ever lived on this earth, Jesus would still have died because that's how much you matter to him. Listen, I'm going to read another verse from earlier on um, in the book of John, right before Jesus goes to the cross. And you've got to hear this. This is John chapter 17 and it's verse 20. Listen to this. I do not pray for these alone. And this is Jesus praying to the Father about his disciples. But I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word. Do you believe in Jesus? Are you a Christian? If you do, then this verse applies to you. And if you don't, if you choose to accept Jesus, this prayer applies to you. He says, they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us and the world may believe that you sent me. The only way you can be one is to be the same. Now, we've heard that we're made in the image of God, but we think that we've lost and corrupted that image so much that we couldn't possibly be redeemable. But that's not true. He says, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. The word glory means value or worth. You see, if you've grown up in any kind of Christian circle, you've probably thought about yourself as a sinner. But God says, you're made in his image. And that's what he sees. And the sinful nature, it's not who you are. It's a tarnish. It's a fallen nature. The real you is made in the image of God. But it gets better. And here's the thing. You don't pay for something more than it's worth. When God paid the blood of his son, he was declaring that you were worth every drop of blood. And here's the thing. He then goes on to say this, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you've sent me. And so many people miss this phrase and have loved them as you have loved me. Wow. Guys, how much do you think God the Father loves Jesus Christ perfectly. 
He's never done anything wrong. Well, he just said that God the Father has loved you as he loves Jesus. This is the greatest declaration about this day, about Jesus going to the cross and shedding his blood. It is not a declaration of your guilt. If you want a declaration of your guilt, then that is by not accepting Jesus and coming under judgment and you're trying to pay for your sin yourself. And that's the thing. Guilt and condemnation, fear, that's you trying to pay for sin yourself. But there is one who has already paid for your sin and his name is Jesus Christ. And he is fully God and fully man. He was born of a virgin. He was rejected. He was betrayed. He was despised. He was stripped naked and his hands tied to a pole. And he was scourged till the flesh hung off of his back. Why? Because you were worth it. Here's the thing. I want you to picture for yourself. Picture just a moment, wherever you're at, whether you're sitting or standing, close your eyes. And I want you to picture there being iron bars all around you. And a huge padlocked gate right in front of you. And if you look through the bars, you can see an electric chair down the hallway. You're on death row. And here's the thing. Not only are you guilty, but constantly in your mind, you're, repay, you're replaying the crime you committed. You're guilty. They got it on video. It is obvious. It is beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're guilty. And here's what the scripture says. The scripture says all have fallen short. All have sinned and all have come under condemnation and all are worthy of wrath. And here, Jesus himself, in Matthew 6, listen to this. If you don't think that you're guilty before God, listen to this. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You might say, well, I've never slept with somebody outside of marriage. But have you ever looked at a woman, looked at a man, and desired them? That's adultery. That means you're guilty. What else did he say? Then he said, you heard that it was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform your oath. And he says... Let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than that is from the evil one. Have you ever not kept your word to somebody? That makes you guilty. Beyond that, the Bible says, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. If you're not perfect, you're guilty. And it also tells us that sin brings about Death. Now, this is a really important point. You have to hear this. When we sin before we come to Christ, it's not because of the world around us or anything like that. No, the scripture reveals that we have a fallen nature. And that comes from our father, Adam. There is evil. And look, look, I knew this because I grew up under condemnation. I grew up in a legalistic Christian circle. And so I was well acquainted with the law. I thought about the Ten Commandments every week and I, every day I went through them and I thought about what did I do wrong. If you've ever lied, if you've ever taken something that wasn't yours, if you ever looked at somebody and desired them, lusted after them, then you're guilty. And I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that I was evil and I hated who I was, but I couldn't overcome it. I couldn't. And look, here's another passage you've got to read and listen to this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase this as I go through it. But it is the perfect picture of us underneath the condemnation of God. 
And I'm going to kind of paraphrase this, but it's in Romans 7, starting in verse 15. For we know the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, I'm fleshly, I'm evil, sold under sin. For what I do, I don't understand. For what I want to do, that I don't do. But what I hate, I do. If then I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that God's law is good. But now... It is no longer I, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will, to want to do the good is present with me. But how I can do it, I I, I can't find out. For the good that I want to do, I don't do. But the evil I wish I wouldn't do, that I constantly do. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer me who does it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that is present in me. That evil is present in me, the one who wishes I could do good. Because I delight in the good, the desire to do good and moral things inside, but in my body, I am captive to the law of sin. Oh, wretched, despicable man that I am, who is going to deliver me from this evil? evil body of death, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen to this too, okay? I don't want you to miss this. This is Romans 10. And it's starting in verse 2 and it's Paul again and he's talking about the people of Israel. Now the people of Israel had the law. They knew what was right and wrong. But they couldn't do it. For the scripture says, by the law, no one is saved. And this is Paul. He says, verse 2, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. They desire to do good things, but not according to knowledge. For they are ignorant of God's righteousness. That means they're ignorant of God's ability to make them right good and right standing, meaning not guilty before God, but they seek to establish their own righteousness. They want to make themselves not guilty in their own ability, and they've not submitted it to God's ability to make them not guilty. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That means That that constant battle of trying to do right and wrong and worrying about that on the inside of who you are, Christ ends that. And he presents you with a different option. That is, you're not going to be accounted guilty or not guilty based off what you do. But you'll be counted as not guilty based off what Jesus does. Guys, this is real. Listen, okay? Listen to this. This is verse 9. If you confess, if you declare, if you speak out loud with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You'll be declared not guilty if you believe. Now, belief is an interesting thing. Remember that moment where I describe the iron bars, okay? That you're surrounded by iron bars and you see at the end of the hallway, you see death row and you know you're guilty. Here's what belief is. Imagine for a moment, you hear a knock on the iron bar gate in front of you and you look up and there's Jesus. And Jesus is wearing this white robe and it says, not guilty. It says perfect. It says, I've never done anything wrong. And he opens the gate. He then sits down with you and he offers you an exchange. He says, I'll take your place. But here's what you need to do. I need you to take off the orange jumpsuit and the name tag you're wearing that says sinner and evil and give that to me. And I'll give you my white robe that says not guilty, that says I've never sinned. 
And when you confess, when you believe in Jesus, you're taking off that orange jumpsuit. So let's say you do it, you hand it to him because part of you doesn't really believe he's gonna do this, but you've never had a better offer and you have no other option. So you give him the orange jumpsuit, he places the white robe on you. He places the crown, a crown. Remember, you're in death row, a crown on your head. He puts on the orange jumpsuit and he puts on your name tag. And the moment he puts on your name tag, the meanest, angriest looking prison guards you've ever seen into your life, they throw open the gate. They speak your name. They say, it's time. And you are trembling. You're in the corner, pressed up against the bar, but they don't take you. They take him. And they're calling him by your name. And they're saying he's the one who did all the evil things that you do. And you look and you watch and you say, no, 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 that was me. I was the one who did that. And Jesus looks at you. And he says, no, you're not. I took that. And you see, they walk him to the electric chair. They tie his arms down, and the whole time he's locked with you. And he says, I love you. He says, you're worth it. You're the pearl of great price. You're worth everything. And you see the prison door is unlocked. So you walk out of the gate and you're staring at this scene. It's surreal because here Jesus is with your name tag, your orange jumpsuit, and they put a declaration, they put a sign over his head with your name on it. And it says guilty and it lists everything you've ever done. And they flip the switch and he's gone. And then the prison guards turn around and you start to tremble because you think, okay, they're coming for me. And they look at you and they say, thank you for visiting the prison, Jesus. Don't forget your helicopter is waiting for you outside the prison gates and they let you go. And you get into this helicopter and it flies you over to this huge mansion. And that is the kingdom of God where you've exchanged your identity for the identity of Christ. It broke the authority of the devil over you. And I need to share this with you in closing because this changed everything for me too. Do you remember in the Gospels, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he's tempted by the devil? So John the Baptist is there and says, and, and baptizes Jesus, and there's a voice that comes from heaven and tells Jesus, you are my beloved son. It's God the Father saying, you are my beloved son. Okay. The devil comes to Jesus, and he tempts him, and he challenges him. He challenges his identity. And it says here, this is Luke 4, verse 5 through 8. It says, Then the devil, taking him on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. And the devil said to him, All this authority I'll give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Listen to this. Most people miss this. The devil said to him, All authority I'll give to you because it's been delivered to me. The devil was the God of this world referred to in Scripture. He was the prince of the spirits of the air. He had authority over this earth. But Jesus being the son of God, Satan knew there were prophecies, declarations that said Jesus was going to be the one to be given authority. And so Satan tempted him to take a shortcut, to not go to the cross, and instead just worship the devil and the devil would give him authority because he knew 
He knew that Jesus was destined for that. But listen to this. This is fast forward to John 12, verse 31 and 32. Jesus says this. He says, now the judgment is upon this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. Now that translation is from the Berean literal Bible. Most translations say it will draw all people to myself. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing, and you've got to hear this. The original translation didn't have the word people there. And the reason is actually because the translators didn't know how to translate that. They didn't know what he meant by draw all to himself. But the context is right here. And it is a radical, radical statement that most of the body of Christ doesn't understand. Jesus says, now the judgment is upon this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. Jesus is saying he's going to draw all judgment. We know this. We know that he went to the cross. We know that he paid for your sins, but he paid for the sins of the entire world. That means that Jesus paid for the judgment that was coming to the entire world due to sin. For every single person, Jesus paid for it. Okay? Do you know what that means? That means the devil, when you accept Jesus, loses his authority to have any rule and reign in your life. Any destruction, any misery, any pain and agony that you felt in your life, lack of peace, frustration, curse that you just know you're under, the oppression you felt of the devil, the guilt and condemnation and shame. When Jesus went to the cross, do you know what he was thinking? He was thinking, I'm going to rescue you from the power of the enemy who brings sickness and pain and destruction and death into the lives of the children that God values so much. Jesus knew that he was going to pay so that you could be set free. And here's the part. You got you to gotta hear this. You've got to hear this verse. This is Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20 in the new NASB. And this is Jesus. He says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, This is after he's risen from the dead. All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Oh my gosh, all authority. Jesus trampled the devil. He took all authority. You know, the scriptures say that in um, Colossians that we are delivered from the kingdom of the enemy, the kingdom of hell, into the kingdom of the son of his light. You have the full purchased blood payment, the exchange. Jesus made an exchange. He made a declaration for all time that you were worth his life. And you are. And here's the thing. All you have to do is believe and confess it. If you don't know Jesus, then God is telling you, come to me. Come to me. And if you do know Jesus, but you've been walking in guilt and shame and condemnation, then I challenge you, lay it down. Let the payment that Jesus made be enough. For those of you who don't know Jesus, I want you to put in the comments, Jesus, you're my Lord. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say this, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that after he died, he rose from the dead, and the scripture testifies, because this group of people, these disciples, as soon as Jesus died, they scattered. They betrayed him, they scattered, they ran away. They wanted nothing to do with him because they were afraid of dying. And then, inexplicably, 40 days later, they go out, they preach, and they die for Jesus. They would not have done that if they didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And then it says he appeared to 500 people. The very fact that I am here 2,000 years later preaching to you the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, that he saved me, that I know him, I talk to him. 
that when I surrendered my life to him, all of the ick, all of the disgusting, all of the depression and suicide that I had was wiped clean. And I was made righteous before God. And I have a relationship with God. I talk to him. I am a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins and he rose from the dead and he is offering you new life, I want you to repeat after me right now. Say this, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you are fully human. I believe that you died on the cross and took my sin, my guilt, and crucified it. And I believe that you rose from the dead and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I ask you to fill me with your presence, with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. That means that you're a member of the family. And guys, I encourage you, subscribe to this channel, comment below, tell me that you accepted Jesus. Let me reach out to you and pray for you. I'm going to be sharing more content about the gospel on a regular basis and encouraging people because Jesus has changed my life and I want you to hear and grow and become mature in Christ. And I'm going to be pouring out what God has given me. And I want you to receive every single thing that Jesus has for you. Okay, guys, if, if you've already been born again, and you're still listening to this message because the Lord has woken something in your heart that you have not counted the cross as valuable as, as Jesus declares you are, that you're not free of guilt and condemnation, then I want you, in your own words, okay? I want you to surrender. Get on your knees and say, Jesus, your cross is everything, and I want to live for you, and I want your cross to determine my value. I encourage you to say that in your own words. Guys, I really appreciate you watching this Good Friday message. I hope that it touched your heart, I hope that it encouraged you to come to Jesus, not to me, to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith, to surrender to him. And if it did, let me know in the comments below. So again, so I can pray for you and encourage you. And guys, let's get ready <laughs> to celebrate Easter Sunday for what it means, Resurrection Sunday for the fact that it declares for all time the Son of God is risen. He is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen indeed. Love you guys.